Uh, well, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> I do this presentation on an annual basis. So sometimes I wonder who's online, who's not. Uh, so bear with me. And uh, but I wanted to also refer that at the bottom of your email that you received uh, also has a link for past uh, conferences. And I think I um, listed there a couple of the past ones, especially prehab. So feel free to visit that to, as a complement to what we're talking about. But I want to touch base today with regard, first of all, thank you, Greg, for uh, having me. And uh, it's been a long journey and I love it. I enjoy sharing what I, my passion, so to speak. So I'm looking forward to this. I want to change something. And at times I wonder, I'm um, being redundant and I'll get that feedback from you, Greg, but I want to, because we have new people every time and hopefully I'll get a different insight every time. Uh, but we're going to talk about the unhappy triad. It's a term that we use quite a bit in physical therapy as it pertains to the knee, but people somehow get cliched out into one body parts like that. And we want to talk about that a little bit more, how it pertains to the lumbar spine and variety of the lumbar spine. Uh, <clears throat> the, I have no dis disclaimers to uh, announce, declare this time. Uh, so the unhappy triad, I'll put different connection, kind of put things into perspective, is the lower quarter, we have the lumbar, the SI, and the hip joint as a one component, the, how they interact together. Then you break each one separately, We're talking about the disc facet and the muscle as a dynamic stabilizer for the spine. And that is going to be our topic for today. And if you look at the SI joint, the sacrum, the ilium, and the pubic symphysis, how they play together, and the hip joint component, and the most common that what put the unhappy triad on the map is the ACL, MCL, and the, MC, and the medial meniscal tear. And they all tie up together in the lower quarter. And when we address the lower quarter, we address from the lumbar spine or mid thoracic all the way down to the foot. And that's why I put the, just as a, a note to have you ponder about the, if you have a hallux rigidus, how does that impact the back? And that's a huge component with the compensation. If time allows, We'll elaborate on that or feel free to reach out to me later on. Uh, looking at the lumbar spine as it uh, pertains to the disc and the facet, and my intent is to address the physical therapy aspect of differential diagnosis, as well as what we look at in the disc and the facet joint. And having the relationship between both the facet joints and osteoarthritis, and there's a high correlation between the genre of changes of the disc that can impact the, uh, the facet joints and where the disc degeneration precedes the facet joint degeneration. And it's very common to see that in the L4-5 more than the L5-S1. And as we look at the disc itself, the disc height determines the range of motion of the lumbar spine. If you can imagine you're standing on an inflated ball, you have much more excursion and different as reflection, extension, side and rotation. And as the disc degenerate, as more compression of the facet joints, so the movement in different direction will be impacted. And as we talk about this, we'll elaborate on the impact of that. And uh, but the L45 is a key troublemaker, as you might know, the mostly fused parsley segment because of the uh, changes in the facet joints and the tropism in that. And there's a quite a bit of the variance, and that's the most changes we, we see that that's outside the scoliosis uh, patients with that. So if you're looking at an average range of motion of the variation between left and right, but also with somebody with spondyl aesthetic uh, condition, it can go higher up to between 16 to 24 degrees and changes, which would limit the range of motion in one direction, it limits or favors a movement in one direction, which is when we evaluate the patient, and this is very important, we look for the aberrant movement, we look for the hypercompensation inflection, we look if there's a flat back, we look at uh, any hinging with certain movement. And uh, when I get into the clinical assessment with that, we'll hopefully address that. But this is very important, look at the facet joints. And we look at that, the crepitus in the facet joint, the cartilage, what makes the uh, cartilage the hyaline cartilage, which has a chance to be a cushion uh, and padding for the, for the facet, but also the term chondromalacia patella, it applies to the facet joints, chondromalacia softening of the cartilage, which is affect the facet joint as well. That we see the crepitus popping noise, not just manipulation part, but the crepitus due to arthritic condition changing with that. Um, so we're looking at the multifidus. Uh, we talked about the increase uh, irritability, increase atrophy of any the multifidus muscle with pain and pain inhibition. 
and that has been documented, but also the fatty infiltration within the muscle itself is highly uh, visible with degenerations. Almost there's a correlation between the fatty content in the multifidus with degenerative changes in the lumbar spine, which might indicate inhibition component as also disuse because of lack of uh, um, involvement in recruitment pattern with that habitual compensation and splinting of the spine that minimize the muscle uh, hypertrophy coordination which is important part of the stability of the spine. And there's a denervation, of course, that's gonna become a big impact of it. And uh, with the denervation, just a quick note on that, uh, looking at the rich literature recently <clears throat> came across, there's a, a medial branch of the posterior primary rami had been saved with doing the RFA, and uh, which is the choice de jour as, as far as I know with regard to the pain management, but we know also with that particular process, there is a impacting on the muscle function and clinically, and I say clinically because there has not been any research that supports that, I've seen decreased coordination, decreased recruitment and awareness of the multifidus muscle following the RFA. Knowing that we'll come back in a year or so, that's still a good thing. Hopefully by that time, we'll work with that. And the tough part with this particular procedure as well is as we increase the activation of the, of the muscle, because the lack of proprioception, the patients tend to work harder thinking they are engaged the muscle more, but we know that with the multifidus, we need to start with lighter resistance before the bigger muscle, the paraspinalis kick into that so as a protective mechanism. So what, is that, what does that mean for us as a physical therapist? So we look at the optimal stimulation for generation. That's how we can recruit, for example, muscle conditioning, the ligament extension. If you have sprained ligament, you need to apply tension to that ligament to promote the fibroblastic activity to become stronger, not to splint it. A splinting the ankle sprain uh, will become a big issue. And we've seen the history of it is that frequent ankle sprains, uh, it might be at one point inhibitive a movement pattern that will impact the L5-S1 because most of the muscle impacting the ankle sprain is L5-S1, including the perineals and the plantar flexors. So the optimal stimulation for the nucleus, because it's sensitive to the compression, decompression is any weight bearing exercises, isometric. When you do isometric contraction, the two ends of the muscles kind of compress the bone, creating that for whether it's for osteoporosis, but for stimulation such as walking, will be good exercise for someone for not necessarily an acute disc, but that's why also patients who have a disc problem, walking feels better because that engages the muscles around it and helps stabilize that spine. As far as the annular fiber to address that at the cellular level, the way we look at it uh, is it's modified tension line of stress because the 50%, you know, about between 12 to maybe 15 layers of annular fibers all in, in an angle. So that, gives us the fact that is rotation is the choice of exercise for the lumbar spine. Mind you that with the rotation, if it's done in a neutral position, there's a minimum amount of rotation in the lumbar spine that goes maybe about one to two degrees per segment. Now, if you have somebody in flex position, you open up the facet joint, creating more vulnerable uh, situation in the lumbar spine. That's where most injury happens. So we have to train the muscle to stabilize that, but also to strengthen the uh, annular fibers with doing the exercises. With this particular exercise, for example, doing lower trunk rotations, the abdominal muscles engaging, and we'll tell the patient, keep moving to right to left. Once you move the ASIS, that tells us that the movement at the L5-S1 start kicking in, kind of stimulate some optimal stimulation in a non-weight bearing, then we'll move them into weight bearing direction. And that's when we can go into an upright position the next part that we address is the facet joint consideration. The facet joint, we deal cartilage. Cartilage optimal stimulation is in two folds. One is compression, decompression, as we see that in the knee, but also we're looking at gliding. So gliding as such as flexion, extension, side bend, and, and uh, flexion, extension, and side bend. And what uh, my approach was and is right now is to address it from the bottom up caudal to cranial because we have to bypass the big torso. And anytime you lift your head up, you move your upper body up or raise your arm over your head, you create longer lever arm that creates increased amount of torque and tension on the lumbar spine, causing more uh, fulcruming point, especially the hypermobility. So we address the 
uh, cod of the cranial segmentally trying to recruit the multifidus at least one to two segments at a time and work on developing the spine with that. So that's how we look at the tissue and lesion versus just one movement. But if we strengthen the actual tissue, then it can withstand additional stress in different direction, uh, including lifting and weightlifting and exercise with that. So I'm going to walk you through this differential diagnosis that we do, for example, and that's why it's worthwhile to share with you. For example, if looking at the right facet locking, that we see that because it presents as a hypomobility. But the question why the hypomobility kicks in with that is as a protective mechanism as locking and presents itself as a hypomobility. So here, uh, if you see my cursor, this is active range of motion. This is passive range of motion and resisted examination. And these are the movements. And under resisted examination, uh, we tested an inner range of motion, middle and outer range of motion. I'll explain that quickly here. The flexion, when you have somebody that has a locked facet on the right side, as you flex forward, the two facet joints move forward. And because this is locked into extended position, it does not move. So the patient might deviate to the right side and deviating ipsilaterally to the area of uh, dysfunction, which might not have any pain with that. Extension, however, because it, the facet has to go backward, because this facet, the left one continues to go back, so he can deviate back into the facet, uh, creating that also having pain because there's a compressive component here. Right side bend cause right side bend because you're loading the facet joint. And left side bend is usually not painful. It feels tight on the right. That's why it's very important for us to investigate and ask the patient, when you say pain, I wanna know what kind of pain and don't accept it as the ultimate, oh, I'm bad. Uh, if it's a good pain and bad pain, that's why I look at it and explain that to them in a very simplified way is that uh, light pain, if st stiffness, tension, tight is okay. Sharp pain, nerve pain is not okay. Then looking at the, uh, left side is tight on the right and going to the right side. When we go to the right side, the facet actually gap uh, on the right side. So that will give us a little bit more of a distraction force. And that's the treatment of choice down the road is to lock that segment, to flex it, side bend it to the left and rotate to the right as a, with a manipulation adjustment and or mobilization to the lumbar spine. Left rotation causes compression to the right side. And with the passive range of motion, definitely will be limitation on that because it's not much, the facet is locked. Uh, the extension will be positive actually. Sorry, I missed this one here. It's positive uh, because you're compressing the joint. And passively, I sit him down on the edge of the table, uh, feet straddled on the floor. I support their upper body and move them in different direction. I put my hand from between their arms under the shoulder and move them side to side to get different directions. So this is done passively without the muscle. So I'm already starting to differentiate between the muscle and the passive element, such as ligament, disc, and facet joints. And you'll find similar pattern, active and passive. When you have similar pattern between active and passive range of motion, it becomes arthrogenic type of a dysfunction. Now, resisted examination, inner range of motion, flexion in the inner range of motion, that's been curled up in a flex position. And if there's no pain, uh, because the facet joints in the back are open. Uh, extension and outer range of motion that is uh, for flexion is at an extended position. So that gives us more like a compression pattern. So if you look at the yellow signs here, they all, the common denominator with that after a while, and look at that maybe four out of six, uh, then that might give you more a joint issue because the extension in the inner range of motion put the back into extended position. And this is right side bend into put the patient into right side bend and resist them in that direction. However, if there's a pain with active and passive range of motion one direction, I will not proceed with resistant examination because it's going to tell me the same thing. So that's how we're going to look at taking different things. And if things start to smell like a disc or a facet joint, then we'll do other special tests such as compression tests and uh, some nerve tension tests that confirm uh, or give us a working uh, hypothesis what is the problem with that? Uh, so this is what you're looking at the facet joint from a hypermobility stiffness. And sometimes we see spine as stiff in the lumbar spine. And that's because of underlying problem of hypermobility. And as we inhibit the muscle guarding, we will find that the true colors of the dysfunction of hypermobility that we'll have to address to stabilize. The second one uh, as a quick assessment, different presentation is the right capsule strain, for example, uh, which is a little bit different than a facet locking. So if you have strain, that means sensitivity 
to stretch versus the other component, sensitivity to compression. So with flexion, limited deviation to the right because if it's painful, it's gonna go into that side to protect it. Extension is not painful because the capsule is on slack. The right side bend is not painful because the capsule is on slack. But if I side bend away, that stretches and elongate the capsule causing pain. And the same thing with the right rotation because you're gapping that facet joint. Uh, passive range of motion, anytime you apply stretch to that capsule, whether from above and below on the spine, that should be also painful. Now, the inner range of motion of flexion, that's when I bend the spine forward and apply resisted flexion, usually just by bending forward is painful. However, when I resist flexion, this is very important, when I resist flexion, I shift the weight from the capsule in the back to the abdominal muscles in the front that unloads the capsule. So that gives me almost a pain relief in the back. There's no pain because I'm supporting the body through the muscles versus shifting the load on the ligaments. And this is our communication with the patients to let them know that we are actually shifting the weight from the inner structures, such as the disc, the facet, the ligaments into the muscle as a dynamic stabilizer for that to create a habit fold. Extension, the same thing. If I put them in the outer range, outer range of motion, that means in this extension is flexion. And also right side bend, if I put outer range of motion of right side bend is actually being left side bend. So that's elongate that ligament. And if I resist right side bend, what ends up happening is I load the capsule as well as I'm contracting the multifidus and the quadratus lumborum on the right side. Then I have to go, if that's painful, I need to differentiate. Is it muscular component that's tugging on the capsule because we know the multifidus attaches to the capsule and or if it's going to be just the ligament itself that I need to differentiate on the capsule. So what I will do with this, I'll place that particular joint in a close back position, which means I put them in a maybe side bend, extended a little bit, and I resist the lower back in that direction. If the pain is, if it's painful, then I would maybe incriminate the multifidus more than the capsule because at that position, the capsule is on slack and does not generate enough tension to trigger a, the pain receptor with that. So that's something we'll try to evaluate sometime to differentiate what is going on, which tells us at that stage, what kind of treatment approach. I'm gonna stretch the uh, tight capsule or train the muscle in one position. And then we will start training that muscle in a, in a range of motion, get the muscle activated and while protecting the multifidus, uh, while protecting the ligaments in that particular position. So that's gonna be <clears throat> one way to evaluate and get the uh, recruitment for that particular uh, muscle with that. And here, what we do with the multifidus is we'll start progression with a concentric exercise. I don't jump into eccentric because that takes quite a bit of recruitment, just can they engage the muscle because that's the simplest way to exercise that muscle. I do it in side lying. And in the last episode, last video we've done uh, recording, it talks about different progression and there's a videos in the back and I checked them yesterday and they're working very nice uh, and uploaded correctly. So they should be able to go through that uh, process as well to review how we can recruit the multifidus from caudal to cranial with that concentric to increase vascularity, sense of positioning, and isometric as a progression to increase awareness. For example, if you look at the biceps, as I elongate the biceps here, I don't want to see a ratchety uh, movement. So we have very nice and smooth control with that range of motion. And if there's weakness in one direction, then I need to go back and work on isometric, increase proprioception, increase awareness and coordination of that muscle before I start adding more resistance to the eccentric pod. And we'll start with low load to heavy load because if, if you increase resistance with a heavy load, then that increase the recruitment of everything around it. And I want to be addressing the muscle segmentally in a posterior elevated position to recruit the multifidus only which is very sensitive to any change uh, of resistance in all direction. So the next bit from addition from concentric uh, isometric to eccentric and from low, low load to heavy load, then we're gonna, when I can do that is I need to increase awareness in non-weight bearing, especially some of those low functioning to modified weight bearing, such as kneeling, sitting to full weight bearing into dynamic, then integrate the upper and lower extremity challenges and balance into total 
full body PNF, such as lifting a box from the ground all the way up, dynamic sports, and so on and so forth. So that becomes a big component with that. So with that being said, I mean, that's, I think, I'm trying to hit it to the 20 minute mark. And uh, uh, I put some reference in the back and I'd be more than happy to um, answer any questions and or uh, uh, share with you additional information with that. Hey, Yusuf, it's Don Blaskowitz. Thank you again for such a wonderful, enlightening and educating talk. As you're giving your talk, I'm doing my morning stretching. So <laughs> um, I, I think as, as we age, we really come to appreciate sort of these nuances of motion. Um, and as I'm listening to your talk and I'm stretching, I'm actually feeling the areas in my back that you're speaking about. So it's always great to hear you talk. And, you know, I really appreciate you know, how you've educated us over the years um, and the great care that you've provided to all of our patients. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And keep in mind, 30 seconds stretch, don't bounce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I echo that as well, Don. Um, so Yusuf, like, you know, practically when we're in the office, you know, we're yeah, I always challenge you know, whenever whenever you speak. I always, I'm always challenged about my own physical exam and am I taking enough time to really differentiate things enough? And you know, because uh, it, it takes. I mean, how long does it take you to do a full like lumbar spine exam for someone with back pain? Like, what what does that what does that look like for you? Would would you say? That's a very good question. And I, we always challenge when we uh, teach students to do that. I want them to take time to do that, to feel what's going on. After you do it for a while, as patients walk in, you have an idea what's going on with that as the first from the history itself, which is very crucial because they'll tell you what's going on, whether they know it or not. But then the evaluation, to be honest with you, it can be done within 30 minutes. Uh, at times, if it's so clear, uh, do some confirmation because if somebody does not have a neurological symptoms and like the other day I had one lady came in and a physician mind you and uh, was referred to me for ankle pain and that's the third if not the fourth patient that comes to me as a physician uh, been referred to us I, I, again I've, I refer to us sometimes the whole way diagnosis and undermine that I think we're missing a lot of stuff going on but when she came in, she kept ankle sprain, brace, and all this stuff. And by the time she walked in, took her out, but the history does not support that. So once I took that brace off, can you, one of the things, watch and walk, uh, clear up, for example, neuro stuff such as dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, can you walk on your tippy toes? And she could not stand up on her toes nor pick up her foot. Well, she had a big blown disc apparently, uh, no pain, but weakness. And I said, that's, you need to see somebody for the back uh, sooner than later. And sure enough, uh, I put her in a position like decompressed spine, like I flex her to the side and I um, uh, flex to the side, let's say it was on left side, right side bend and flex her up and rotate her to gap that and lift her like in a, uh, a full position. And after keeping that position for like 10 minutes, there was increase in dorsiflexion, which is an increased strength in dorsiflexion, which is a good sign because now tell me the nerve is being compressed, but not compromised. And that means if we create a certain environment for the nerve or the swelling to heal or the swelling that air to decrease, and which can be whether prednisone at the time, because still within two and a half weeks, which is the magical window of time, uh, that may have a good outcome to help support it. So to answer your question, it depends how they present, but Within 20, 25 minutes, uh, I can uh, definitely work as a working hypothesis. And I share that with the patients as a working hypothesis and will evaluate two, three visits because things do not happen that quickly. And uh, with the patients that I've seen, unfortunately right now, I don't see the ankle sprains. By the time I see them, they've been around the block a few times and uh, uh, and I appreciate first yeah, they're of all, all better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know they're not. Be they have developed well, not better, <laughs> but their their pain may be better. <laughs> yeah, they uh, want to be cured over day. Absolutely, but and that's what I'd like to tell them. For example, the I put the note at the first slide: uh, rigid big toe. If you have a rigid big toe, then you have difficulty extending the leg. You can don't have a plantar flexion component. You have less hip extension. 
the glutes get shut down and there's inhibition of the back muscles. So it's a cascade of different things. By the time I see them, such a chronic condition, you have to re and redo it, rebuild it from the ground up, which you have to have them to buy to the concept. It's not going to be quick fix. It's going to be changes. And their role at, at home, with the home exercise, home stretching is a huge part. But I would say 20 minutes with that. And that's why if I see something like this in a acute case, I'll reach out to the doctor right away or ask them to connect with the physician directly to get them to uh, get intervention or share with them. And we'll send the notes to the doctor directly as well. But I'm not sure how many of the physicians that are so busy will read our notes. But I try to communicate that under my assessment section that sums up uh, the at least my assessment on that. You, Yusuf, uh, good morning. You hear me? Yes. Good morning, Dr. Uh, a. Good morning, I've uh, uh, echo again the Don and um, Greg's uh, points. And Thank you. On your last point, uh, first of all, I'm having one of your patients with me listening, but um, on your point, uh, the problems that I had seen in the past have been uh, difficulties in communication between uh, uh, the physical therapists and uh, surgeons. You know, you point out uh, one of the problems of uh, surgeons being busy and not reading the uh, therapist note. And I, I wanted to, if you can briefly mention, what is the point that you like to know when you refer a patient from a, uh, a for, for physical therapy? And what are the important things do you want to communicate to the physician? Uh, it's sort of a, improve that communication eventually uh, helps the patient? That's a very tough one. Um, the best way sometimes, I mean, you're all are busy. I know I referred a lot of patients, for example, to different physicians and there's waiting list and they're so busy with different things. I think there has to be some, uh, maybe a system that um, can screen the call, uh, the, the notes. And usually if I see some um, like red uh, flags or so, I, I usually call, leave a message to the physician. And most uh, people I've connected with, they've been very gracious enough to call back because I, I don't want to not call you if you're busy. I know you're busy, but if I call the same thing when you guys call me or text me, uh, I get on it because that means very special we're concerned about that particular patient get them in sooner than later. I'll make accommodation with that. With such busy healthcare right now between uh, patients at the final hour, especially now this past month or so, everyone wants to come in as a deductible I've met. But I think if there's a way that to flag, I'm not sure we have it in our system itself to flag the note. The good old days when we had the uh, fax, one thing I printed and I uh, circle or highlight or asterisk the area of, of concern and send it and fax it to the physician. And uh, again, hopefully, it will be so many times, uh, Dr. Barney will get the notes out. And when the patient goes to see the doctor, they have not received the note and, and stuff to say why. It could have been in the box to be filed or so many electronic record right now to, to scan through it to see which one would make more sense with that. But we need to come up with a system that red flag or prioritize what is it that we're trying to accomplish without that communication. And, but in most cases, I wait for the patient to go to the doctor, I print the progress note, give it to them. So while in the room with them, they can really take a look at it. And if it's urgent, I will pick up the phone. Let's find the best way to do that. That's great. Uh, thank you. And in addition to that, uh, what do you need? Is it just a diagnosis, you know, like a disc herniation, or do you need more information from the physicians? But I think uh, the bottom line, the key is uh, good communication. So. Thanks. I agree. I agree. And we, we would love to have access to radiology because I look at that a little bit differently. Uh, maybe uh, I've taken a few courses from orthopedic basic things. It's nothing. I'm not a radiologist by any means, but you can read a lot. For example, if you look at a vertebra above and below, if you have the end plates, you see like osteophyte developing. We know there's some jump changes, a lot of shearing because the annular fiber of the disc, excuse me, I'm probably the disc itself as it shears, develops some osteophyte at the end plate. Uh, but look at the mechanics. But as far as uh, from uh, from the physician's perspective, a diagnosis, that will be good. 
And because when we evaluate, we might come up with a functional diagnosis with that. Mostly for us is as a guide, as a like a, a invitation to evaluate that particular area. And when the patients come to see you, maybe you cannot have the time to do a detailed uh, assessment, which is not expected. You're so busy, number one, and your different evaluation uh, uh, that does not, it will need more time with that. So that being said, um, we will communicate back what we have found. And that's what the big thing is. for insurance purposes, we need that diagnosis. Otherwise it's been held to get reimbursed or to get a, uh, the patients approved by certain visits because of lack of the codes with that. So definitely the diagnosis is important for us. And with that, we can send back with, when you send, when you sign off on the plan of care, you're agreeing on the content of that evaluation and the treatment plan that gives us more accurate a diagnosis or accurate prescription to treat. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Yusuf. I think that wraps it up for us. And Excellent. I hope everyone has a great, great week and leading into the holidays. So blessings. Have an awesome thank day you. work. Thanks again, Yusuf. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank take you care. Thanks. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.